This week, I'm in Goa, a former Portuguese colony that has gorgeous beaches, a tropical climate, and is not surprisingly India's most popular tourist destination. Whilst most of India was under British rule, Goa was the exception. It had been colonised by the Portuguese, who were hell-bent on controlling the lucrative Goan spice trade. The Portuguese left their mark. They introduced education, free health care, and their own wonderful style of architecture. And until its liberation in 1961, Goans needed a passport to visit other parts of India. The cuisine is a mixture of hot, sour and spicy flavours. And not surprisingly, the Goans eat a lot of fish. Before I came here, I thought Goa was a town. In fact, it's a state. And today, Friday, in the capital, Panjim, it's market day. And it's as colourful and as varied as you'll find anywhere in Asia or the Mediterranean. Can I have a load of chilies, please? Fantastic, thank you. But I want to dig a bit deeper and find the real goer. Across the Mandovi River is the fishing harbour of Betim. Forgive me, I've seen so many fish markets that the thrill is a long time gone. But the bustle and the simplicity is quite enchanting, although on this day, endless blue or red boxes filled with long, thin silver fish doesn't really turn on this cook. This is the busiest fishing port in the whole of Goa. Normally about 500 boats dock here every day and they unload about 60 tonnes of fish. Now that's not very much fish per boat in fact and a lot of it is mackerel, sardines, very small red mullet and there are some sharks. Luckily, with a little help from my friends, and by the way, the Beatles loved Goa, I obtained some super stuff. One of the most popular and enjoyable dishes here in Goa is a Goan fish curry. I'm going to do a luxurious one with crayfish, fresh crayfish, and make a paste, a masala, from garlic, ginger, turmeric, coriander, cumin seeds, chilies, and black peppercorns. And it's mixed all together with some coconut, and we end up with this lovely yellowy-orange masala. But the first thing we have to do is to add some oil, and sweat down our chopped onions. Now they'd be cooking for a good three or four minutes so they get really soft. Then once they're soft, add the chopped green chilies. To sweat the onions and the chilies right down so they're almost a paste. And similarly, although we're not using tomatoes today, when you put tomatoes in your curry bases, make sure they're very well cooked. Right, I'm happy with that, so we'll put in our masala. And to help its cooking process, we'll add a drop of water, which we're going to cook out so it becomes a thick sauce at the end of the day. Doesn't that look superb? And we'll come back to that when all the powdery tastes have been taken up and the sauce is rich and thick, and we can then put the crayfish in. Now, another very popular dish is fish rashad, and this is a very spicy, hot and vinegary masala that you stuff into a fish like a mackerel, for example. And so for once, we'll actually make a proper one. Into our blender, we'll put some pieces of turmeric. Then we'll add some ginger. And some red chilies, some cumin seeds, coriander seeds, cloves, black peppercorns, garlic, cardamoms, and to give an extra fishy flavour, some of these lovely little dried shrimps, a little bit of sugar. And, pretty unique to go in cooking, some pretty pungent vinegar to make the paste. Well, I think, I think we're pretty, pretty happy with that. We could grind that for hours. So we come back to our fish curry here. I think we're going to add a little drop more water. 
the sauce is nicely mixed, so we can put our lobsters, crayfish, what you will, into the sauce and let that simmer away for a bit. And at the meantime, to give it a tangy flavour, we'll add some pieces of what they call kokum, which is in fact tamarind. And this gives a nice sour, salty flavour to the dish. So at this stage, we'll put the tamarind pieces in. Obviously, the crayfish will be cooked when the shells have turned red and the flesh is nice and firm. Now, the mackerel I've cleaned, defined, and gutted, and inside we stuff it with the rashad. And it's got a lovely pungent taste because of the vinegar. And we also put some in the little slots I've cut into the side there. I love it when we get these audiences. They look at us in absolute bewilderment. They eat this kind of food themselves practically every day, but if it's cooked by a foreigner, they're going to say, no, we can't possibly taste that. It's funny. And simply shadow fry these in a little oil. For about four minutes on each side. So, a luxurious little snack of fresh lobsters or crayfish simmered in a spicy coconut sauce and a tangy, vinegar-flavoured masala stuffed into a mackerel and shallow fried. Even in the manic mayhem of Madras, as throughout India, you always find a certain serenity, but not that you will find on a spice plantation in Goa. There is a pool with floating lilies and grass, and contented water buffaloes nibbling throughout the day. The serenity that is indescribable, and there is a soft aroma of spices which make Goa so attractive and so important. There's absolutely no denying the importance of cinnamon, of ginger, of peppers, of chilies, and so on for making curries. But the single most exciting herb I found is the curry leaf. These shallow fried, so they're slightly crispy in coconut oil, not only garnish a dish, but they add a splendid tangy flavor to it. You can also put the leaves into your sauce while you're making the curry, and it gives it an extra, very refined flavor. They're absolutely wonderful things, and they're unique in India to the south and western regions. Another indispensable spice is ginger, which, like turmeric, is a bulb and grows under the ground. It has a little bit of fresh ginger. It enhances every kind of Indian cooking. You can have it fresh like this, or indeed you can dry it and eventually turn it into powder. When you can use it fresh, that's when it has its really the very best flavour. The cinnamon is a very versatile spice. It's usable in both sweet and savoury cooking, and of course it's indispensable for those hot Christmas alcoholic punches. And it is a piece of bark. It comes off the cinnamon tree. So when the bark turns brown, that's when the spice is harvested by cutting away a little piece like that. And that is laid out into the sun to dry. And it ends up like this piece here. Navies have been commissioned because of it, and wars have been fought over it. What is it? It's pepper. The peppercorn isn't harvested until it's turned red, but it can be used while it's still green, and it's very good when it's fresh. You can mix it into curries, particularly in Thailand they like to use it that way, or it's pickled in brine, and the French use it for their green peppercorn sauces and so on. But it's harvested for black pepper when the seeds have gone red. It's then forced sun-dried, and the peppers become black. If you want white pepper, you simply boil it in boiling water, roll them down a bit of a sort of concrete slope thing to get the black off, and there you have it, white peppercorns. Now, can you identify this fruit or nut or spice? Answers, please, on a postcard, and there are no prizes. It is, in fact, a nutmeg. Plops nutmeg on floor. It's harvested when the outer shell splits open in the sun, revealing the next shell, which is, in fact, mace. 
So you get two spices for the price of one. This outside husk is mace, and the nutmeg is inside. There's always a surprise when you go down to the woods, and this was a surprise. This man is making a very strong liquor from a cashew apple. And incidentally, if you've ever wondered why cashew nuts are so expensive, it's because there's just one nut to each apple. Anyway, they crush the juice from the fruit and ferment it naturally for eight days, then it's placed in a reservoir in this still, which is fired by coconut husks and coconut shells. It's turned into steam. The steam passes through this pipe and recondenses into alcohol here, which he's cooling with a drop of water. That's distilled for eight hours, then it's done again for another eight hours, and you get about 30% alcohol from that. If it goes over 30%, say to 35, it's pure poison. This is a first for me. I've never tried it before. Ah, it's cashew calvados. <laughs> it's really rather nice. Mm. Very nice. Vindaloo, what does that say to you? It means 12 o'clock at night after 18 pints of lager, a blindingly hot curry. Well, here in Goa, things are quite different. For a start, pork is very popular here. You'll see the little pigs running all over the place. Secondly, because the Portuguese have been here for such a long time, they like to add vinegar or wine, hence vin, a loo, and a loo means potatoes. So a beef or a chicken or a lamb vindaloo should have a vinegar-based masala and should include vegetables of some kind with the meat. So what we've got here is a lovely chunk of local pork, diced up ready for cooking, and a superb vinegary masala made from cinnamon, cloves, peppercorns, green chilies, ginger, red chilies, cumin seed, and turmeric. And here in the pan, I've got a few onions frying away in oil. And the very first thing we have to do is chuck in the masala. The masalas are essential to this cooking and they're, as I say, all those herbs and spices ground up into a paste using this pungent vinegar. You I mean you could use some bad wine. Then we'll add some handfuls of pork. Then we'll add some water. Notice the totally authentic red colour of the Vindaloo. There is definitely no artificial colouring in this at all. It is the natural colour of the masala. We'll let that cook away for a bit and we'll add the chopped potatoes when the pork is practically or halfway cooked. Turn that down. Now, pan-fried chicken breasts in a spicy green masala. To make this green masala, I have ground up fresh coriander, coriander seeds, peppercorns, garlic, cumin seeds, cloves, cinnamon, green chili, cardamoms, and ginger, and again made the paste with vinegar. So we'll chuck our chicken pieces into this bowl and tip in the masala and cover them completely with the green masala. In an ideal world, they should go in the fridge to marinate for about an hour before you start cooking. But this, of course, is not an ideal world. This is called television. And we then just simply place the breasts into a little oil and we'll gently fry these on both sides so the flavours are sealed inside the chicken and the crust of masala is slightly crunchy. And on that note, in nearly 91 degrees of temperature Fahrenheit, a slight slurp of the local beer. As far as I'm concerned, this pork vindaloo is totally authentic. The red chilli masala is flavoured with pungent vinegar. It has a wonderful, slightly sweet and slightly sour, fiery taste. And breasts of chicken marinated in a masala made primarily of coriander and vinegar and gently pan-fried. So, 
back off to the hotel now for a superb non-alcoholic Indian beverage. One of the most refreshing drinks you can have is a lassi. Yoghurt, iced and flavoured either with fruit or with herbs and spices. It goes well as a drink and also accompanies Indian food really, really well. So I'm going to make a couple. First of all, I'll make a mango one. I'll put some ice into the blender, some natural yoghurt, some pureed fresh mango, lots and lots of it because it's wonderful, and some sugar syrup. Very easy to make, just sugar heated up in some water. You have a nice thick sugar, but of course the best is made from cane sugar. So that goes on. And there, our first fruit lassi, which I'm going to garnish with some pomegranate seeds and a straw. So the next one is salty and spicy. I've used cardamom seeds, coriander seeds, black peppercorns and some fresh coriander leaf and some salt. The spices I've crushed in the pestle and mortar like that. So the first thing we do, some ice, some natural yoghurt, just plain yoghurt, into there, oh, a little salt, and whiz that up. This stage we'll just add some of the crushed cardamom, coriander and pepper seeds and a little bit of the fresh coriander. And into the glass. And finally, some more coriander and a few more of the crushed spices. So, after my two delicious lassies, time for a postcard. Dear Mum, gone fishing. Love, Keith. This is the real girl, where for centuries, fishermen have sustained their families by pottering about on the backwaters in canoes dug out from the mango trunks and tarred, if tarred is the word, with cashew nut pitch. And here, despite the harshness of manual and often unrewarding labour, they have a tranquillity of life that evades those of us who chase the Western dollar and the pound. But I, of course, have used the Western dollar and pound to buy myself into this next really rather good cooking sketch. Preparing Indian food is actually terribly, terribly simple and very easy and really quite quick as long as you've done all your preparation logically in advance. So for these mussels, for example, we're going to cook them in turmeric, coriander, black peppercorns, lemon juice and chilli and garlic paste. Already frying away in here, I've got some finely chopped onions and chopped tomato and green chilies. Just whack the heat up there a little bit. At this stage, we mix in some of our garlic and ginger paste. Let that cook off for a moment or two. Then we'll add a little turmeric. Cook that till we get the powderiness out of the turmeric and everything is well amalgamated. Then we'll add some lime juice, lime or lemon juice, it doesn't matter. Both are equally delicious. Carry on cooking for a little bit longer. Then we can dip in the mussels. We add a little drop of water, not very much. And let those cook away until they're open. Now, over here on the other side, we're going to cook a crab. I've got a great big crab because these little ones are a bit fiddly. I'm going to cook them with coriander seeds, red chilies, cumin seeds, fennel seeds, fresh ginger and garlic. All that 
I've whizzed into a paste. This is my red masala for the crab. So in here, we've got some onions, just frying gently away. Then we'll add into that our masala. Cook that well. And we can add a little drop of water just to thin it down a bit. It was incidentally the Portuguese who introduced chilies to India. And the chilies they have in Goa are seriously, seriously hot ones. And then add the crab meat that I've taken from about four crabs. It's a rather extravagant dish, but it's well worth it because it's very delicious. And cook gently away. Back to our mussels. Gas has gone out, it always does. The wind will either blow like a hurricane. There we are. At this stage, we add in some crushed black peppercorns and lots of fresh chopped coriander leaves. Another couple of minutes, those will be open and they'll be ready to eat. Where's my beer? I thought I was going to be given a beer on this program. You said I could have a beer if I cook these quickly. Typical. They tell you fibs in television. Coastal Goa is rich in fish of all kinds. So we have a lovely stuffed crab shell with fresh crab meat and a hot red chilli curry. And some green-lipped mussels cooked principally in turmeric and lime juice. Goa, what a contrast to so many other parts of India. Now the food in its own right is very nice, but there is one slight confusion here. You have got sort of Indian food, Goan food, Chinese food. You've even got Bob's Bar with plowmen. So you need to pick your way through carefully to enjoy the best of what Goa has to offer. And that is a lot.